Hello everyone, in this video I'll be explaining every single rigid body constraint in Blender in under 10 minutes. This video assumes that you have a basic understanding of the rigid body system. If you don't, you can click on this video to learn more about it. Before we get started, we need to understand what a rigid body constraint is. Basically, a rigid body constraint is a joint between two different rigid bodies. When using constraints, they're meant to be connected by an empty object. This makes the joint position easier to move and rotate around. However, if you don't want to use an empty, you don't necessarily have to, but it's recommended to keep everything organized. To add a rigid body constraint, you first need to select your two rigid bodies, then go up to Object, Rigid Body, and then select Connect. This will add a new empty object between these two objects and you can see they're connected with that black line. The other way to connect them is to select one of the rigid bodies, and in the physics panel, you can select constraint right here. Then in the objects tab, select your two rigid bodies that you wanna connect. Again, using this method is limiting because the joint position is the object that you added the rigid body constraint to. Using the empty method is a lot better because you can actually move and rotate it around very easily. So for the rest of this video, that is the method that we'll be using. If you select your empty, you'll be able to see all of the different rigid body settings and values. You can change the different type of constraint in this menu. Now before we talk about each constraint type, we're going to talk about the common settings for the rigid body constraints. Enabled is pretty easy to understand, it basically tells Blender that this constraint is on or off, and this value can also be animated to create some cool effects. If Disable Collision is checked, the two rigid bodies will not collide with each other and they'll just pass through. If unchecked, now they will actually collide and bounce off. Breakable allows the constraint to break after reaching a certain threshold. For example, with the fixed constraint, which we will talk about very shortly, the object will fall and if the impulse or velocity is greater than the threshold for the breakable amount, it's going to break and the constraints will separate. Likewise, if the threshold is stronger than the velocity, then it will remain connected and won't break. And the object menu, of course, shows which two objects that you have connected to that constraint. Underneath that, we have the override iterations. In the scene panel, underneath the rigid body world, you will see the solver iterations. This is the amount of solver iterations that will happen per simulation step for every single constraint in the scene. Higher values will make the simulation more accurate, but it will take longer to simulate. That being said, in the constraint settings, the override iterations will allow you to set the amount of solver iterations for that specific constraint, just in case you need more for that one without affecting the rest of the simulation. So there we go, we've talked about the common settings, so now let's jump into each individual type and learn what it does. We briefly talked about the fixed constraint, and basically what this does is it connects two rigid bodies together, as you can see on screen. They will stick together until you disable it or the constraint breaks. The point constraint basically acts like a rope between the two objects. Keep in mind, for this to work, you need to have the first object set to passive. If it's on active, the second object will just fall indefinitely. The point connection is based off where the empty is in the simulation. As you can see here, the object is going to swing just like a rope. The hinge constraint is exactly what it sounds like. It basically just acts as a hinge joint. And the hinge is based on the Z rotation of the empty. For example, for this simulation to work, I need to rotate the empty so that the Z is pointed sideways. Now it'll swing like it would in real life. We also have a new setting here called limits, and this setting is common for the rest of the remaining constraints. With the Z angle checked, you can set the rotation limit and it won't go past the degrees that you set there. The slider constraint allows the rigid bodies to move along the X axis. And again, you can set the limits here of how far you want the object to move. So remember, Angular is for rotation and linear is for movement. The piston constraint basically combines the hinge and the slider into one. You can have movement along the X axis and it's gonna rotate along that axis as well. You also have the limits tab here, just like the hinge and slider. 
The generic constraint basically is an all-in-one constraint. It allows you to limit movement or rotation for each of the different axes, x, y, and z individually. In this example, I've left the x angle unchecked, so it has free reign to rotate along the x, and then I've set the y and z to zero, so it can't rotate on those different axes. In the movement, I've set the x to zero, the y to zero, and I've set the z up to a value of 10 in the upper. So it can move 10 meters in the up direction, but it can't go below uh, zero for the negative z. And here is the result. And now for the generic spring constraint. This acts basically like a bungee cord for your object. Again, you have the limits which you can control how far you want the object to move or rotate, but now we also have a springs tab. These values here control how bendy that spring will be. Specifically, the stiffness controls the strength. Higher values will make the spring stiff and lower values will make it loose, so it's kind of bouncing around. The dampening value basically dampens the rotation or movement of the rigid body until it eventually comes to a stop and the values that you set here control how fast it will stop moving. The generic spring constraint is probably the most versatile constraint and you can customize it and create a lot of cool effects with it. Finally, the motor constraint adds constant rotation or movement to both connected rigid bodies based on the location of the empty. This time the direction is based on the X axis. We have two different values here for target velocity and impulse. Target velocity controls the speed of the motor. The higher the value is, the faster the motor will be. Max impulse deals with the strength of the motor. If the rigid body object outweighs the max impulse, or if there's another object on top of it causing more weight, the motor will stop working if the max impulse is low. In this case, we would need to turn up the max impulse in order for the object to actually move. All right, in this scenario, I want this platform to rise up and I want it to spin and I want it to stop about three meters up here. So how do we do that? Well, first we need to connect these two rigid bodies together. So let's select the platform and then the ground will go up to object, rigid body, and then select connect. If we select this object here, we can change the type over to motor. And again, since it deals with the X axis, what we need to do is go into front view and then we need to rotate this so the X is pointing downwards. This will make the object actually move upwards. Then over on the right side, we're going to enable linear and angular so it rotates and moves up. And if we play this, we can see it is rotating, but it passes right through our ground. So make sure to uncheck disable collision. And if we play it, we can see it's kind of working, but the max impulse is too low. So what we need to do is for the max impulse in the angular and linear, we need to set this up a lot higher. Let's go with a value of about 15. Now, if we restart and play it, we can see it's going upwards, but now there's another problem. It's just rotating and flying all over the place. In this case, we need to add in another constraint to lock certain axes so that this object only moves upwards and only spins on that Z axis. So to do that, we're going to select both the objects once again, go up to object, down to rigid body, and then select connect. With this one, what we're going to do is change the type over to generic, and then we're going to lock all of the axes that we don't want. Since I want it to rotate along the Z, I'm going to check the X and Y and set all four of these values down to zero. So it can't rotate along those different axes, and then I'll leave the Z unchecked. Then in the linear, I'm going to lock the X and Y, set both of these values to zero once again, and then I'm gonna turn on the Z, and remember, I want this to go up three meters, so I'm going to set the upper to a value of three, so it locks it right when it reaches that height. So now what happens is if we play it, we can see it is working, but it's basing the movement off of this empty. So what we need to do is just press Alt-G to snap it back to the center. We'll move it up so it's a little bit out of the way, now if we restart, it will only go straight up and rotate. So that is how you use the motor constraint. And there we go, that is all of the rigid body constraints explained in under 10 minutes. Now keep in mind, you aren't limited to only using one constraint per rigid body. You can actually combine multiple constraints to create some really cool effects.
For example, I used the generic spring constraint and the motor constraint, and I was able to create this catapult effect. If you want a separate video learning more about how I made this catapult, let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed, consider subscribing to see all my future Blender tutorials. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you guys in the next one.